Hi, this is Dr. Emily Park with your next Functional Health Minute. I'd like to continue on talking about SIBO slash EMO and some of the root causes as to why someone might actually get SIBO or EMO. So of course, you know, in one of the previous videos, I talked about that IBS SMART test, which is a blood test to look and see if your SIBO or EMO started after you've had about a food poisoning. So we do know that's very clear. If you, you get a food poisoning, it's enough to obviously upset the balance, the microbiome balance specifically in your gut and um, trigger an autoimmune-like process that creates antibodies um, against your, um, specifically the nervous system in the small intestine, which then in turn slows down motility, which then in turn allows bacteria and or archaea to overgrow. And then that's what creates SIBO or EMO. So that's one way you can um, get SIBO. Um, another way that you can, um, that's a common uh, cause of it is treatment with antibiotics. And it's not to say antibiotics are bad, right? You get an acute infection, you need to take it. You, you know, you have a, a strep throat, you have an awful skin infection. You, you know, if you, 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 you got to take antibiotics to get that acute infection cleared up in a lot of cases, right? Um, that's okay. But that antibiotic may kill off specific bacteria that allow other less healthy bacteria to overgrow or archaea to overgrow. And then that can kind of get the SIBO process started. So antibiotics is a cause. Um, there are a couple other medications that can contribute to SIBO, uh, steroids and proton pump inhibitors or acid blockers. But I will tell you, um, the data is pretty clear. It's, it's not to say every patient on a PPI is gonna get SIBO or every patient that's taken steroids is gonna get SIBO. Um, it's just one of the factors we look at. Um, way more likely with someone that ha get, ha does a course of antibiotics to get SIBO. Now that's, or EMO. That being said, um, is it common for people to have SIBO or EMO after a course of antibiotics? No, um, it's not, right? Most people, you know, they might have a little bit of an upset stomach while you're taking a course of antibiotics, but then when you come off the antibiotics, that goes away. Um, but for some people, it doesn't really go away. And, uh, you know, that's because SIBO or EMO is going on. So, so, so far we've got, you know, you can get a food poisoning and you can get it from medications like antibiotics, less, less likely steroids and or proton pump inhibitors. And then um, there are also anatomical things that can happen as well. And uh, so, so that's related to, to what's going on in the abdomen as far as have you had surgery there? You know, did you have your gallbladder out? Have you had um, abdominal surgeries? Have you had, you know, a portion of your small intestine removed? Have you, um, you know, had a C-section or pelvic surgery? Basically, if you had pelvic or abdominal surgery, what can happen, and again, it doesn't happen 100% of the time, right? Um, most people have their surgeries, they recover great, all good. Um, but what can happen is these adhesions can form after surgery and adhesions are these like, like sticky, like rubber bands that form between um, organs that are in the abdomen. So it can form, it can form between organs and it can form between an organ and the abdominal wall as well. So it can form between like the small intestine and the abdominal wall or the small intestine and another piece of small intestine, et cetera, et cetera. So these um, adhesions create these restrictive bands that don't allow peristalsis or, you know, regular um, healthy motility to occur. Um, in the small intestine, especially. And when that happens, if you think about it logically, you're going to have, you know, the food that's supposed to move through, you know, your small intestine at a certain rate, right, at a certain, um, you know, motility speed um, is going to get slowed down. And that will allow the bacteria or archaea to ferment basically and overgrow. Um, and then that can, you know, contribute to a SIBO situation. Um, aside from that, another, you know, abdominal and pelvic cause can just be, you know, congestion as in, you know, like the lymphatic drainage or the venous drainage um, is not optimal um, and, 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 and things are kind of um, swollen. They, you get some edema there and, um, and then that can slow things down as well. So if we talk about, you know, what to do as far as treatment, of course, we want to kill the overgrown bacteria or archaea, right? So, um, and we may do that by starving them out, you know, with the elemental diet. Uh, we may do that with prescription um, antibiotics. And there are um, certain antibiotics like Rifaximin, for example, that has a really good track record for SIBO and EMO, usually paired with a second 
antibiotic, depending on whether we're talking about hydrogens or methane. Um, and then there's uh, lots of lots of different herbal antimicrobial protocols um, that include other things for support, of course. Um, both if, if I have someone doing prescriptions or herbals, they're getting um, an additional supplement support regimen regardless. They're gonna be on, you know, like a, a spore-based probiotic. They're gonna be on digestive support with digestive enzymes in between HCL. They're, you know, likely to be on a biofilm buster. They're gonna be on, of course, you know, antimicrobials, the killer part of it. They're gonna be on, you know, some good healthy prebiotic fiber. They're gonna be on a motility support agent. You know, it's a comprehensive approach. Um, and then of course, you know, the anatomical side of it, if you have, if that's a factor, um, and it's not addressed, you might have success in, you know, curing your SIBO, but then it is likely to come back. So just want to kind of review the different kind of, you know, risk factors and, you know, slash ways that you can get SIBO. Um, and it's if you are struggling with IBS symptoms and you really don't understand why, I would highly recommend going to see a functional medicine provider because there is some really good data to support that. Um, a, a, a good majority of IBS patients, you know, actually have SIBO or EMO. Of course, you know, in the functional medicine world, there's lots of other reasons for IBS symptoms. We look at things like, you know, food allergies, food sensitivities. Um, we don't just look at the small intestine, we look at the large intestine, what's going on there, their overgrowths, you know, parasites, imbalances, yeast overgrowth, et cetera. You know, we look at the full, full picture. But um, if you are struggling with IBS, I highly encourage you to figure out what the root cause is. It's, even if you take medication that helps you feel better, whatever started it, you know, is still, you know, going on and can create some health issues long-term, especially when it comes to the gut. You guys have all heard me say at this point, you know, the, the vast majority of your immune system, 70 to 80% of it is located inside the gut. And the more and more research that comes out, there's a gut everything connection. So we really do want to make sure that you've got a good, nice, healthy gut. This is Dr. Emily Park with today's Functional Health Minute.